So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome all of you to this lecture. This is going to be, this lecture is designed for researchers. It's designed for researchers and it's important that I do this for all researchers from undergrad, master's, PhD, even postdoc, so that they will have a firm grounding of this topic on DEA. So we are going to look at productivity change. And in order to understand productivity change, you want to understand efficiency change. Most of you know about efficiency change, but I'm going to use a sample point to make the point clear. This is going to be more interactive. So if you don't understand something, you ask the question. All right. So first thing that you want to notice this, you should know that efficiency has to do with the ability of a firm to increase output given the input or decrease input given the output or simultaneously augment output and contract input. That is efficiency, simultaneously. So we are going to consider efficiency using these five frames. And all of these five frames are in one period, and the period is period one. So you can see that in the yellow frame, all of them are in period one. The frames are using one input to generate one output. So for example, a DMU, a decision-making unit A, in period one, is using four inputs to produce five outputs. But unit E, DMU E, in period one, is using six inputs to produce nine outputs. Which of these are the most efficient? Well, the most efficient one will obviously be the ones that determine the efficiency of the others. And therefore, this is known as relative efficiency. Now, the first way to understand this is to plot this data set. So I'm going to plot this A, B, C, D, E in period one for each firm. Oh, by the way, did you all plot yours? Have you tried to plot yours? Yes, we've tried. Yes, right. Doc. So yes, Doc. if you plot this first group, you see, at this stage, because I'm talking about efficiency, the time doesn't matter. The period is irrelevant because efficiency looks at performance at a point in time. Productivity change. And always when you mention the word productivity, it's important to add the word change to it. If you don't want to add the word change, you make it dynamic productivity. Just to introduce the time dimension. Because productivity deals with time. Productivity needs time. And so I'm going to plot this data set X and Y for each firm, like a normal Cartesian plane, X and Y graph, four, matching five. And when you do that, four, this is four, okay, matching five, and that is A1. So you can see A1 has been plotted here. Four is matching five. B, B in the year one is, if you can remember, it was 12, 12. Just so go back. So you can see that B is 12 and 12. So if I want to plot 12, I go to 12 here and then match that with 12 there. Where they meet, that is my B. You all know how to do this. So there's no problem with that. So far, so good. Are you all following? Yes, sir. Now, how do you estimate the efficiency now of each one of them? You can't. You can use regression, you can use stochastic frontier analysis, you can use thick frontier analysis, you can use distribution free analysis and several other things. Now I want you to ignore the convex line, the piecewise linear convex envelopment for now, the green line, ignore it for now. And assume them scatter plotted. Each data point is there. 
So what is happening is that DEA, Data Development Analysis, is allowing this data to speak for itself. What do I mean by speak for itself? Well, we are not going to impose any structure on the function of this. Okay, in a regression, stochastic front analysis, take front analysis, distribution free analysis. What you do is that you impose a functional form of the production, of the cost function, of the profit function, of the revenue function. You impose it. What do I mean by impose it? You assume a Cobb-Douglas production function. You assume a constant elasticity of substitution production function. You assume, you know, any kind of production function or cost function. If it is cost function, sometimes they call it transcendental logarithmic. It's, we call it translog function. You, you fully are flexible. These are different kinds of functions you will impose. So when you hear the word impose, it means that you are, you are just pushing it on the, on the data. And then you are telling the data to, to come and behave like the function is behaving. And then after that, you will now have to now estimate a regression sort of, and then the regression will have an error term. If it is a normal or ordinary least squares OLS regression, the error term is one. If it is stochastic point analysis, the error term is split into two. And then you will have, you know, one part of the error, so that compose error, one part becomes a noise, the other part becomes inefficiency, which you want to reduce. That's what it does. That is what stochastic frontier and all of it. And of course, this error term also has several distributional assumptions. The error term might be normally distributed, half normally distributed, Leon TF distributed, MacFadden, log normal, and several other distribution are imposed again on the error term. And all of this make it quite difficult to even follow that. DA from Chance Cooper and Rose and Banker Chance and Cooper, 78 and 84, what they do is that they allow the data to talk to you. And you need minimum extrapolation principle to do that. All you need, and these are reasonable assumptions too, are just these two axioms. The axiom of free disposability and the axiom of convexity. Where is the free disposability? The free disposability is saying that this FEM A or FEM B can be inefficient. Now, how can you be inefficient? You can be inefficient if you are not using your existing resources to produce the maximum output you are supposed to produce. Then you are inefficient. So it allows for, for the FEM to freely dispose of some of the you know, input or output. So if, if you are producing an output, we are not going to say that you are always going to increase your output. Sometimes you will not increase your output. You will decrease your output rather, which means you are inefficient. That is free disposability. And you tend to see that free disposability assumption on the horizontal section from D1 to the right here and on the vertical section from A downwards. These vertical lines and horizontal lines depict free disposability. So when we talk about minimum extrapolation principle in the book by Panasolis in 2001, the one that uh, Francis was talking about, okay? When we talk about that, it's just those two assumptions. So I've spoken about free disposability, which is also called strong monotonicity. The next assumption that you need is convexity. What is that? Convexity says that if A1 is there, and you can see that is there. Yes, Miriam, ask your question. Doc, please, can you go over with the minimum extrapolation assumption? The minimum extrapolation principle says that all you need to do DEA, all you need to determine the efficiency of a fan in a group are just two assumptions. All you need, minimum you need, are two assumptions. And those two assumptions are free disposability and convexity. 
And so what I've done is that I've explained free disposability and I'm about to explain conversity. So the minimum extrapolation, you see the word, in order to extrapolate, in order to be able to make sense or come out with a conclusion, all you need are some minimum assumptions. Does it help now? Yes, though. Now, what is convexity? Let me show you something. I pray that I'm able to do this drawing with the line. Okay, so suppose that I have a point, okay? And this is a point here. And then I have another point, which is a point here. And these points were actually data points. Okay? But let me just remove them. These points are actually data points. So let's take a point like C, and then a point like B, and a point like A, and a point like E, and a point like D. Okay, these are points. Now, before then, let's ask you, because they are already put together, let me just give you one that is not put together. Good. The minimum that convexity assumption says that this point is there, it's feasible. And that point is there, it's also feasible. When I say feasible, these are DMUs, these are FEMs. You can see it with your naked eye. So when you say Echo Bank, Echo Bank is there, it's existing. When you say GCB, GCB is there, it's existing. According to the convexity assumption, since both of them are feasible, they are there, I can linearly combine them. I can combine these two points. And when I combine them, I can create a line. That linear combination of these two points, two feasible, producible points, is what is known as convexity assumption. And of course, in the combination of these, in the combination of these, certain returns to scale assumption will have to be applied as well. But a key point is that if this is possible and that is possible, if both are possible, then I can linearly combine them. And that is also possible. And so I can linearly combine this and that. Okay. I can combine this and that as well. And I can combine this and that. Okay. And I can combine this and that. And I can combine this and that. Okay. I can also combine this and that. I can combine this and that. I can combine this and that. I can combine this and that, this and that, okay, and combine this and that. Are you guys getting the point now? Yes, Doc. So yes, in the doc. process, what I'm doing is that I am creating a beautiful polyhedra. A hexagonal or pentagonal or octagonal, a complete polyhedral that captures the production space of feasibility as long as each one of them is feasible. So, in this case, the production possibility set, the, the production possibility set, what is known as the technology set, is the space of the combination. All the combinations is a space. This is a technology set. This is a production possibility. On the basis of that, I can now combine A to E, combine E to that. But the DA says that if you are doing this combination, you got to have certain things in mind because you want the best. The firms that are extreme, which firms are those? Well, when you look at this, the extreme firms, they are the ones, these ones, these extreme firms, they are the ones you should do the combinations for. In fact, the other ones you can do it for, but the thing is that they will not be efficient. So you got to take the in the in the space here, you got to take those that are on the stream, on the stream. And when you look at when I say on stream, I'm talking about the northeastern part, north, south, east, and west, okay? or northwest. North. If you look at this thing, it's you know. The northwestern part of this, this graph, those that are on the you know, top left in this case, in this graph, in this input and output graph, those that are on the left, combine them, draw a line, use the principle of linear combination, and then create, watch, watch this, create, create 
a linear, okay, creates what is known as a linear convex envelopment. Watch the word, a linear convex envelopment. Linear, you understand? Convex, yes. As you go, you can see that the thing is becoming convex. And envelopment, as you know, the thing is being enveloped. Everything else here, okay, between this and this, have been enveloped by those extremes. So please note, DEA is an outline methodology. DEA is an outline extreme value methodology. Whilst that is a good side, it's also a bad side. The good side is that it helps you to be compared against the best guys on the, on the stream because the best guys are always a stream. If it is a football and you want to compare yourself with the guy, best guys, you want to pick countries like, like Brazil, countries like Spain, countries like England and Germany and you know, Argentina and things. You want to compare yourselves with the best. And so eventually you will become among the best. But you don't compare yourself with the average. But whilst that is an outline, so you're comparing yourself with the outliers. Whilst that is a good side, it's also a bad side because what it means is that what if this is a true outlier, which is causing a problem? Okay. Let's say there's a particular fan here on this edge here, okay. and this swim is there. What it means is that the frontier will not go on the right there, it will go here before it goes there. Okay. It will go here before it goes there. Now, because it's an outline methodology, because this is truly an outlier, there's an error in this data. It is going to define the rest because the rest, the efficiency are going to be measured relative to that. And therefore, that is a disadvantage of DEA. And so whenever you are talking about your methodology, you have to also bring out both the pros and cons of the method. Okay. Now, let me ask you some questions. Can you tell me all the firms that are efficient and all the firms that are inefficient? Now that we have created the convexity line and we've drawn our VRS frontier, who can tell me? So, mm -hmm. from the frontier, DMU A1, DMU E1, DMU D1, are efficient. However, DMUB1 and DMUC1 are not efficient. Good. So what do you think are going to be the score for A1, E1, D1? One. Good. How you got a one, we'll come back to that. Okay. Now, okay. So, so these guys create the frontier and we know in principle that they have a score of one. What about these guys? Who are not on the frontier, how do you determine their efficiency scores? Well, the way you determine their efficiency score is the same way you determine this efficiency score, but the only thing is that she didn't mention exactly how she got to the one. So this is how you determine the efficiency score. You can determine the efficiency score in an input direction, what I've just shown here, okay? That is an input direction. So moving this way is an input direction, okay? Or you can determine it in an output direction like that. Any one depends on what your industry is looking at. In an input direction, the way you determine it is distance to the frontier divided by distance to the firm. Okay. So if I want to find efficiency theta, okay, theta for any particular DMU is going to be the distance to the frontier, FR, divided by distance to the firm, Fi. So how do you do that for C1? Well, it's a distance from the origin, is always from, the, and the origin is here, by the way. So it's distance to the frontier divided by distance to the firm. That's how you do it. Okay. Distance to the frontier divided by distance to the firm. Let me just take a particular example okay, and then show that. So if I have this one there, and I want to determine that uh, B, okay, B1, B1, is distance from here to the frontier, okay? And the distance from here to the frontier, to get the value, you have to pick the, and this is an input direction. To get the value, this is where the value is. So the value will be somewhere here. 
So the value is likely to be somewhere around 9.2, something like that. Okay. 9.2. Of course, to be able to get the actual value, you don't use graphical looking at it with your eye. You never do that. Guys, never ever in your life use your eye to tell me the answers. And some of you will mistakenly do that. That's why I'm saying it now. I remember Dinah used to do that. Okay. So what you do is that you have to use a software and the software gives you the value. Then you come back and come and put it here as if you use your eye. That's what you do. Okay. So distance to the front will be like 9.2. Then distance to the frame. So the same distance. Okay. So you go and do the same one. Distance to the frame. And that is, yeah. And that is 12. So it's going to be something like 9.2 divided by 12. Of course, this is not the exact value. And if you want to do, that's an input oriented. If you want to do another input oriented for, for C, okay, you want to do for C, it's the same thing, distance to the frontier divided by distance to the frame. And so that value, you pick it from down here. That value is going to be like five. Then this one here is going to be like um, 11 or something. So the score is for C1, its efficiency is going to be five over 11, something like that. Not exactly. These are all input direction. If you want to go output direction, you climb up. Oh, by the way, how do you do the, for the A1? Well, the A1 is the same thing. It's going to be distance to the frontier, which is four, divided by distance to the fan, which is also four. So A1 is actually one because it is actually, and, and this is why sometimes you don't take a unit know that you calculate it. So the theta for A1 is going to be four over four. And that is what gave us the one. So each one of them that is on the frontier, you don't just say, oh, because it's on the frontier, it is one. No, you have to know that it's the same approach you're using. You're calculating the distance to the frontier and then the distance to the frame. So in this case, it will be six over six. These are all in the input direction. But what about in the output direction? Okay. What about if you want to estimate the efficiency in an output direction? In an output direction, if you want to do for C1 here, the same style, but this time you go vertical. Okay. You move from the origin to the frame to the frontier, distance to the frontier, okay, divided by C1, distance to the frame. And now how do you read the distance to the frontier? When you get there, you have to pick it from here. Okay, That is 14. And then the one to the frame, that is, you pick it from here, that is seven. So the score, the output oriented efficiency score is going to be seven, uh, sorry, it's going to be the distance to the frontier, which is 14, over seven. Now the output oriented is given by five. The input oriented is given by theta. The output oriented for C1 is just what we just did here. And that is 14 over seven. Now watch it. You see that the output oriented score is always greater or equal to one. This is important. This point is very important for your productivity. And the input oriented is always between zero okay, and one. Zero is exclusive. We don't want it to be zero, okay. but one is inclusive. Now, in both the input oriented and the output oriented, when the score is one, in both cases, the firm is efficient. The firm is efficient when the score is one. But in the output oriented, when the score is greater than one, watch the parameters. When the score is greater than one, the firm is inefficient. And the input oriented, when the score is less than one, the firm is inefficient. So you got to get it. These things, we've learned them, but I'm just recapitulating so that you can get a bigger picture. So whenever you are doing, using the, the score to estimate productivity, it's very important to recognize that it is less than one or is greater than one. Because some of you are going to use input oriented because you are doing cost. Some of you are going to use output oriented score 
because you are doing um, simply a, a, a productivity with an output oriented mind. Some of you are going to do non-oriented. Non-oriented is when you are reducing the input and increasing the output at the same time. So suppose I am at C1. Okay, suppose I'm at C1 here. If I want to get a non-oriented, I go this pathway or use a hyperbolic to go this way or use the directional distance or use the um, multi-directional efficiency. But the thing is that I don't go leftward or topward. I go diagonally. Okay. Either diagonally by curve or diagonally by line. Okay. So that one depends on what kind. So that is, that is a non-oriented. Now, when you are doing non-oriented, note, the, the score is also between zero and one, just like when you're doing input oriented. So just take note of that. Non-oriented guys is between zero and one, just like input oriented. All right, any question on this so far? No question. I'm done with productivity. I'm done with efficiency. I'm gonna go to productivity unless you have a question. So now you know how to estimate the score. So you can estimate the score for each one of these things. Now, this FEM A1 is FEM A in year one. B1 is FEM B in year one. C1 is C in year one. What if the same FEMs go to year two? Ah, then that also gives us another frontier. So when you go back to the data set, you see that we have year two, period two, the same A, previously it was using four to produce five, but now it's using eight to produce six. And so we can plot all the firms in year two on the same graph as we plotted the firms in year one. So this was the firms in year one. And this is a variable returns to scale frontier. Please note, we can also draw the constant returns to scale frontier. How do you do that? And it's important you learn how to do these things. The constant returns to scale frontier doesn't start from where this one is starting from here. No, 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 it doesn't start here. It starts from the origin, constant. And then it takes the extremist guy here and creates just one constant returns line. So the CRS goes this way. So, so the CRS, okay, one, it, it, this is how it will look like, the constant returns to scale graph. That is how it looks like. You take the extremist guy. So you can see that CRS normally will, will reduce the efficiencies. Why? Because you can see that under the CRS, only E1 will be efficient. But under the VRS, three of them will be efficient on the green line. So we tend to say that the CRS is more discriminatory than the VRS. All right. As to which one you do, which one do you select? We'll look at that in the test because you have to do non-parametric test of retention scale to be able to come out with which industry is exhibiting CRS or VRS. But for now, note that that is how the CRS would have done. Okay, let's go to the second year. So in the second year, we're gonna plot this same one, okay, this same um, C2 frames on the bottom here, on the graph here. And you can see that that is the frames, the same A, but this time A is no longer on the efficient line, it's inside. And you can now see that we have a VRS2, a frontier two. Get a point. We have the VRS frontier too. So I'm not going to go too much into this because you know how I got all of these things. So I now have year one and then year two. I can now superimpose that together. I can put each one on the other one together. I can now combine the two together. All right. So, Chris, I will ask you a question. Okay, Doc. Chris, from this first plot, from the CRS graph that you showed us, we can see that only one firm is efficient under CRS in this case. Is that going to be the case in every situation or we can get about two firms being efficient under CRS? In fact, you can even get about 100 firms. Life is not about five DMEs. As you can see, the DMEs are heavy are small. So that is why only one. You can do um, work real life, 
and you can have this guy is on the frontier. Okay. You can have multiple firms who are on the frontier. You can have this guy on the frontier. You can have this guy. You can have this guy. Plenty, plenty. Okay. Like that. And so you can have about 10 or 20 or 1,000 of them. You can have big data. Okay, sir. So, Thanks. And the key point between the CRS and the VRS is that the CRS is more discriminatory, and I'm sure you understand what I mean by that. Uh, you mentioned that it's discriminatory, but it wasn't so clear. Okay, can somebody explain what I mean by CRS is more discriminatory than VRS? Anybody? Yes, Doc. Um, I think what I had to say was that because the CRS picks the extreme DMUs to form the frontier, Unlike the VRS. Yeah, but what, what do we mean by is more discriminatory? In, in, in which sense is it discriminatory? Anybody? Okay. I think it's because it's, it's the CRS excludes most of the DMU from the efficiency. That line. is good, but not just the word most of the DMUs. Is it's not just excluding most of the DMUs, but what? What there are some specific kind of DMUs? Which DMUs? The efficient. The, uh -huh. That's what efficient. we mean. It excludes most of the efficient DMUs. So a DMU could have been efficient under VRS, but now under CRS, the DMU will no longer be efficient. Does so that mean that it will no longer have this value of one? And of course, if it probably even had a value of eight, it might go down to say 0.63. In other words, it cuts down the efficiency score of the firms, unlike the VRS. That's what we mean by is discriminatory. And guys, in, in DA analysis, in DA work, you want, to, you want a model that is more discriminatory. But of oh, course, it must make practical sense too. The fact that it's more discriminatory doesn't mean that if it's not practical, you are still going to use. For example, if an industry is not exhibiting CRS after testing, you don't need to go and force it and use CRS. If it is exhibiting variable retention scale, that's what it is, that's what it's got to be. All right. So let's go to the combination of the plots, okay? The combination. So you had the year one plot, you had the year two plot, and now we have the mixed plot. We've put all of them. So now you can see a DMU that is in year one, DMU A in year one, and you see that same DMU A in year two. And you can see that the plots are different. Guys, when you are plotting, it's important to understand this, that you can see that I'm using a box here. But then in the, in the first year, I'm using you know, circles all around with a different color. So not just circle, but it's also a different color. And then when it comes to the, the year two, I'm using um, a square with also a different color. I could have used a star. I could have used you know, triangle. There are several of these plots in Excel that you could use to do your plotting. It's very important you distinguish your plot. And it's also very important you don't use the default one that Excel automatically gives you. Guys, I hope you understand what I mean by the default one. You know, when you normally start, you know Excel will give you some blue, 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 blue plot. No, yours is to yeah. use the whiskers and the, use the markers, the filling and the markers and the incremental sizes to, to, to beautify the plot. Even how you label them. I know Miriam was struggling how to you know, label some of them. You have to learn how to use you know, box you know, word and to be able to label the things very nicely. How to copy one of them and then you know, paste it and then you nudge it to label the others. It must all, and watch it. The labeling must always, most of the time, be above above 
So you can see that B2 is above the line. Okay. The labeling is above the plot because I know that the line is going to come down. Okay. E2 is above. If you bring it below, it doesn't look nice. They are normally above. But for those that are inside, you can put the label on the right, on top, on the left, or down. Okay. You know, one of them. But labeling must be done beautifully. And then the, the plot size must be bigger enough See, I'm sure when you're looking at mine, it looks clear, it looks bigger enough. Imagine if yours was so tiny, tiny like this. And the other one tiny like that, yeah, tiny like this. Okay. When it's like that, it doesn't depict the beautification. Perspective is very important. When you're doing this. Okay. So now you can see that the two frontiers are intersecting. Sometimes frontiers are drawn where they are not intersecting. Sometimes some of them are even parallel. Take note of these things. Some of them are parallel. We call them hex neutrality. Hex neutrality. Hex neutrality is when the frontiers are parallel. When they are parallel against each other, then hex neutrality comes into the picture. But life is not all parallel. Life can be zigzag. And that is what this frontier in particular is showing here. Now, with these two frontiers, we can estimate the efficiencies. This time, we can look at not just A, how A is doing. No, we can look at how A is doing relative to year one frontier and how A is doing relative to year two frontier. But not just that. We can even look at how A1 is doing relative to a frontier, not frontier one, but a frontier called frontier two. You can look at how A is doing relative to frontier two, a frontier that is not a cell. Why do we do that? And this is where productivity comes in. We are doing that because your environment and your time affect how you do. This is key, environment and time. That is, that is what productivity is hinging on. You can tell me that you are doing well. You can tell me that you're a player. You're a very good player. You can tell me that you are messy. You are a dribbler. You're a wonderful top-class player. But how good you are would depend on your team, which is your environment. That's the first one. How good you are will also depend on the time. Like whether you are 18 years and then we are playing that game in 2022. Or you are 37 years, Ronaldo, and we are playing that game in 2022. Your time, your age, and environment is important. Guys, you understand what I mean? Yes, sir. That's good. We do. Good. So, so Ronaldo can be doing well at given the time he's playing. If Ronaldo is doing well in 25, at the age of 25, it doesn't mean that Ronaldo will be doing the same equally well in, at the time he's 37 years. That is different. Very different. Okay? Because of the way it is. That is different. And so, you, so Ronaldo is doing well depends on the time. So A1, what is the score of A1? A1 is efficient. Okay, good. That same A, we have moved the A into a different time. Now you can see that the same A you thought he was doing well is no longer doing well. It's inefficient. Guys, you follow me? Yes, so A has been punished by what? A has by been time. penalized by time. So time determines you. Now, the second thing is the environment. Even though A is in year two and is inefficient, A is inefficient because of where the frontier, the red frontier is. What if the red frontier was actually passing through here and going there, okay? Then in this case, A would have been efficient still. But then the frontier is not. It's not where A, A is in year two. And that is what makes, so again, it's not just the time, but it's also the environment. Your colleagues, the technology, the technology. 
And that is where productivity looks at. Productivity looks at how are you doing over time given your technology? Efficiency looks at how are you doing at that time given your technology? But this one is how are you doing over time? So over time, time is important. In fact, in efficiency, you don't even consider these time dimensions. Now, on the basis of that, Caves, in 1982, Caves et al., CCD, Caves, Christensen, and Diwet, now uh, you know, brought about the, 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 Mam, the Mamquist, what is known as the Mamquist productivity in a DEA environment. Of course, they, they use the principles of the activity analysis and Farrell approach, and then you know, created the Mancus productivity. But then the Mancus productivity was not actually clear in DEA parlance until Fair, Groskov, Lengrin, and Ruse in 1992, when they used linear programming methodologies from DEA to estimate. Of course, you can use stochastic frontier analysis and, and, and stochastic distance functions to be able to come out with MAMQuest in the SFA world, but we want to focus on the DE world. So the MAMQuest productivity, it was named after Professor Stein MAMQuest in 1953, where you can now estimate productivity of a firm across time periods. In this case, the time periods you are considering are two time periods. So, but we can do something here too. It's not only this two years you can consider. Now, the Marcus productivity considers two years at a time. So you are comparing two years, comparing your performance over a period of two years. Okay. Even if you have the year 2000, okay, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, you would take two of them at a time. So you can compare 2003 and then four. You can compare 2002 and then four. You can compare 2001 and then two. Like that. Okay. It looks at two time periods. But then there must be different times. Okay. So that you can even look at trends and patterns in productivity. Now, what is interesting here is that in order to be able to estimate productivity, one needs to understand efficiency because as you can see, it is efficiency scores that we are going to look at. Now, if you estimate A1 relative to frontier one, that is known as own period efficiency score. If you estimate A1 relative to frontier two, okay, A1 relative to frontier two, not its own frontier, that is called cross or mixed period efficiency. Oh, guys, note that sometimes there are some other beautiful names for it. Sometimes we call it intertemporal efficiency. So note that cross period, own period, intertemporal, same thing. So now to be able to finally come out with a productivity change of a firm, you need to be able to get all of these four different efficiency scores. What are the four? Two own periods and then two cross periods. That's what make up the four. Two own periods and then two cross periods. And that is what we will be doing, okay? Now, I'm going to put some things here. So you can see that here, I've decided to now create the constant returns frontier for the year two as well. So you can see that the one we did before, Christopher, you asked that question, why is the zigzag black line passing through only the tip? Now you can see that it's also passing through only the tip for the second one. Yes, sir. And you can see. Now, the reason why you have to always have this in mind is that when you are estimating productivity and the components, you will need both the CRS and the VRS graphs. That is if you want to demonstrate graphical. You will need that. So for you in particular who is working on bootstrapping productivity, you will have to know about this, all of this, just as it is here. You need to know about them because by you need the constant returns and the variable returns graph to be able to do complete decompositions. 
but to watch something. Not it's not just that, okay? There's also something that you got to note. I was asking if Caves, Christensen, and Diwets, they introduced the MomQuiz productivity using productivity analysis and then feral efficiency. And then uh, Fair, Groscop, Lengren, and Roots in 